I just have a, a couple things to say. We have one has to do with Camp Ashraf, and you will be seeing a video of, of the events that happened there. Uh, the, the United Nations, the European Union, even a, a parliamentary delegation from Iraq want to go to the camp, and they have not been allowed to do so. And lastly, none of this would have happened if the MEK had been taken off the foreign terrorist list. Um, the foreign terrorist list designation has, in fact, put all the lives of people in Camp Ashraf in jeopardy. Um, our bureaucracy keeps kicking the can down the road, but this has a human consequence. Uh, first of all, condolences. Um, what we saw in that film, what we know uh, happened was a terrible tragedy. And uh, as I was watching the film, a couple of things, I've seen it before, I, it was sent to me and so I was watch, I had watched it before, but this was on a bigger screen. And um, things that popped out were the fact that uh, the residents of Camp Oshroff were unarmed. And uh, the folks that were uh, shooting at him were aiming their fire, and this was aimed fire. This wasn't firing guns in the, to try to influence in the air, to try to influence behavior. It was uh, picking out targets and then shooting. And I guess the other thing that struck me, and I know it struck many people here in this audience, were the uh, number of women that we saw in the, in the hospital. Um, a, terrible, a terrible tragedy. Um, courage. Encouraged by those that were taking pictures, and the mother of one of those young women that were taking pictures is here with us today. Unfortunately, uh, she she died because of uh, of this action. Uh, but what courage by the folks of the camp! And so my condolences um, are offered uh, on behalf of uh, of my family and and all of us. I think that uh, understand this tragedy. Um, Clearly, there has to be an investigation, and people need to be held accountable for this, this strategy. Um, Delisting the uh, MEK is clearly uh, the right thing to do, and it's way past time to do that. And then there has to be some permanent structure put in place to make sure that the residents of Camp Oshroff are protected. And whether that's UN-based or whatever the basis is, it, it seems to me that uh, that absolutely has to happen. Uh, it was a very emotional, moving, and tragic film. And I want to express my personal condolences to the folks at Camp Ashraf who are watching this, to their families and loved ones who are here in the audience, to those who suffered the losses, and to those who are bearing the burden of trying to help change their country. I think all Americans appreciate the courage and the dedication that you've shown there, and our hearts are with you. Thank you. When I look at what's happened in Camp Ashraf over this past weekend, I, I find it absolutely deplorable and inexplicable. We did make a promise they would be protected persons. That's the word of the United States of America. That's important. It's vital. We talk about American credibility, there it is. But more importantly, even than that, how can we hope to help those inside Iran who are seeking a more open and liberated government 
if we can't help those in Camp Ashraf who are simply asking for protection and an opportunity to live their lives in peace. On the, in the video a few minutes ago, we were certainly shocking, and the courage we saw was very moving. And like many in this audience, I would like nothing better than to see the end of the Khamenei Ahmadinejad regime. Before I begin my own remarks, um, I want to read a letter from General James Jones, formerly of the Marine Corps, former National Security Advisor to President Obama, who wanted to be here this morning but could not. But he sent this letter. Ladies and gentlemen, I deeply regret that I cannot be with you today to join with you in the mourning of the horrific loss of life in Camp Ashraf to yet another unprovoked attack on unarmed civilians by Iraqi forces. This most recent attack should never have happened. It certainly should never happen again. The mounting awareness over the issues of the security of the people living at Camp Ashraf and the appeal for delisting the MEK has now reached the point where it should be possible to make the adjustments necessary to our national policy. Those who planned and executed this attack should be held accountable for their actions, and we should lead the international effort to do everything possible to ensure that a similar tragedy is not repeated. Signed, James L. Jones, General U.S. Marine Corps, retired. The Iraqi government, apparently acting at the behest of Iran, invaded, as you heard, more than 30 dead, the camp occupied, Portions of the camp that are used as a cemetery cut off, medical care denied to the wounded. In 2003, when the United States invaded Iraq, a general of the United States Armed Forces acting as deputy commander of the coalition forces in Iraq gave a solemn written guarantee to the residents of Camp Ashraf that they would be treated as protected neutrals under the Fourth Geneva Convention, and that that status would continue. What is happening in Ashraf is a human rights tragedy and a political disgrace for the United States because it occurred after U.S. troops withdrew and while the United States Secretary of Defense was himself in Iraq visiting. Make no mistake about it. What has enabled this, what has allowed it to happen, and what is it going to continue to allow it to happen again unless we do something about it, is the continued listing of MEK as a terrorist organization on the State Department's list of foreign terrorist organizations. Now, in Camp Ashraf, the events that happened on Friday are, are, are tragic and extraordinary and, and observable. And what has happened so far? Well, we have uh, many of the organizations, the UN, uh, the EU, uh, the Arab League, who have all condemned it, are deeply disturbed, are concerned. We have the United Kingdom, which is troubled, our State Department, which is worried. The question is, it's fine to deplore it, but the, what are we going to do about it? How do you get Band-Aids on the people who are bleeding? How do you deal with this problem right now of getting an element in there to fix the problem? So I want everybody to understand that I appreciate the courage of the opposition and the resistance movement and what you signed up for. The video showed at the beginning certainly puts into context the petty, ridiculous policy debates we're having in Washington, D.C. And I am very sorry for your grief. Uh, I share in your sadness and your outrage, but I am encouraged by your spirit. I would encourage this group to disseminate this video as widely as possible. Because to the extent that I understand my fellow countrymen and women, I believe that those images, which are more powerful than anything that could be said, will stir the moral indignation of the American people in a way that will advance the cause that has gathered us here today. There is no society on earth, no religion, no nationality, that would support the kind of brutality, the senseless killing of unarmed civilians, the slaughter of women, that we witnessed in that video. Um, I uh, didn't expect to see the film when I arrived today. And my reaction to the film is, uh, I think, similar to a lot of you in this room as I looked around the room. It brought tears to your eyes. This senseless violence 
right there in front of us. And I want to say to those at Camp Ashram that I'm with you. And I want to say that the real terrorists are not the innocents at Camp Ashraf, but the Iraqi soldiers who drove the Humvees and pulled the triggers, and they must be brought to justice. And you know, you look at the events, the horrible events that I alluded to that we saw today at Camp Ashraf, and you think, well, you know, in a way, it kind of flows out of the policy of the last 10 years. If you ask who is the beneficiary of U.S. policy, the main beneficiary of U.S. policy in the last 10 years, it's been Iran. Having served with the Moshe Hadin as the base commander, prior to that working with the Moshe Hadin as the uh, J3 of detention operations, and even when I was the anti-terrorism officer for Operation Iraqi Freedom 1 and 2, I was well aware of the Moshe Hadin and the outstanding work that they were doing and how they were cooperating with us. The Ashraf residents, uh, when I arrived, I had found 3,500 people. What I found, built out of the desert, the flat desert, was a beautiful compound. It had parks, it had lakes, it had water. Whenever I was with the Moshe Hadin, I always drank their water. I did not want bottled water because it was very sanitary, very safe. I found a hospital that was very functional. I found generator buildings. And what impressed me perhaps most of all was the mosque. The mosque, even though it had the double steeple of a Shia mosque, was open to all in the community. The Sunnis would come in and worship. The Shias would worship. They would worship together. The Americans were welcomed in the mosque. It was an open facility that all of us could go into. That is showing a very progressive society. If Iraq really wanted to step forward and do great things, they could get with Ashraf and learn how out of a desert a beautiful compound could be developed. One worker that was specifically assigned to Ashraf was a very hostile influence, would come up and very much belittling, generating reports that were totally wrong, and I found out, painfully, she was feeding uh, these uh, uh, national security advisor, Rubier, sensitive information which he was feeding straight to Iran. When I got to the State Department, I found people working the Ashraf issue had no idea. I had to show them the photos. I had to show them pictures of leadership. I had to basically give them Ashraf 101. We also addressed the issues of did they attack the Kurds. I provided them documentation from uh, Mr. Zubari, who is the, uh, the head of the Kurdistan Democrat Party International Relations, who said they didn't. The very next report coming out from the State Department claimed they did. And it was very, very frustrating to work with people who weren't talking to each other and weren't working with each other and was actually basing their intelligence on rumors. One serious rumor, and I'll move on quickly, that uh, concerned Ashraf, we received from this same agent while I was there, the, uh, this uh, State Department person, is they were recruiting and training Iraqis to go ahead and join. Given the name of the compound and the grids, I went to the compound with Farid, and what we found were Iraqi workers staying there during the week because if they came and left, the death squads would pick them up and kill them. They, we need to stop reacting with rumors and saying, oh, the Moshe Hadin did this, the, uh, the Mech did this, the Mech did that, and then go with facts. And when the facts are pointed out, these rumors quickly disappear. I think first, it's absolutely essential that we open Camp Ashraf to the world's media, that we open it to the European Union, to human rights organizations, to Iraqi parliamentarians and American senators and congressmen who want to visit. Second, I think that we need to demand, not ask, but demand that the findings of the U.S. team that visited Camp Ashraf after the latest tragedy be made public immediately. And third, the U.S. State Department needs to delist the MEK immediately.